Christmas. Christmas. It's still Christmas, everyone. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Turn in your hymnals to number 246. We'll sing all the verses of joy to the world. the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, please. Once again, uh, good morning and a uh, happy new year and Merry Christmas. Uh, we, Christmas is uh, oftentimes treated as a day in our culture. Christmas, we will talk about today, is, uh, is a season. There are 12 days of Christmas. Remember the song? On the first day of Christmas. All right, okay. So we've got 12 days of Christmas. The first day of Christmas is December 25th, and the 12th day of Christmas is... January 6th, the Epiphany, which was Christmas before there was Christmas. Before there was a Christmas, there was a celebration of the revelation of God's heart and himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And that was celebrated on January 6th. So from December 25th to January 6th, we celebrate Christmas. So we just got started in the church celebrating Christmas. And you're like... I don't know, man. I'm putting together, putting up all my decorations, and I got, you know, wrappings on the floor. Well, in the church, we are beginning to celebrate Christmas. So it's a great day to be in God's house to celebrate uh, God's coming to us uh, and what he has said about himself as the word has been made flesh in Jesus Christ. I do ask you to take a moment to sign in the registration pads. Those are found 
At the end of the pew, there's a little uh, pad there. If you could fill out your name and uh, legibly, please, and uh, any information that we don't have on you already, uh, like your address, your phone number, uh, email address, and then check any of the boxes in there that apply to you. We do not have Wednesday night <laughs> supper uh, this Wednesday, uh, but we'll be getting back to Wednesday night supper on the 17th. Uh, in the meantime, uh, check any of the boxes that apply to you so that we can serve you as a church. And uh, many thanks to our ushers for giving us bulletins as we came in today. Read that carefully. Uh, it, there's a lot of things that you need to know about uh, the ministry of your church so you can take part. Uh, remember that, um, that we're in the process of uh, a planning program for the future of our, our church called the uh, Antioch Project, we are in a time of prayer, and we have uh, uh, some folks who are leading us in prayer that God will speak to us and guide us for his dream and his calling for our church and not our own. And uh, we will have a time when some folks from our district and our conference will meet with us from January 12th until the 14th. Uh, we'll have a church-wide gathering on Saturday morning, January 13th. Uh, where they'll talk to all of us uh, throughout uh, the day on the 12th. They'll be having interviews with uh, our leaders in our church. And then on the 14th, our superintendent and other leaders from our conference will be uh, in worship with us uh, to talk about uh, what they have heard from us so we can listen to one another to discern what's, what God is calling us to do uh, in the years ahead. And uh, following... Following what's called the Barnabas Weekend, January 12th through the 14th, uh, we'll have a church-wide meeting to, to vote on what they have shared with us. And uh, if we choose to move forward uh, with their recommendations, then uh, they will hire a team of coaches to help us in the coming year. So uh, I do ask everybody to be praying for this process and, and to be, plan to be with us the weekend of January 12th through the 14th, especially make plans to be with us in worship on the 14th and, uh, and, and uh, pray that we'll all be working together for God's calling for the future of our church. I do want to make a quick note that uh, uh, Joanne, our financial secretary, is in Houston with her family for Christmas. Isn't that a good thing? That means that uh, there'll be nobody in the office tomorrow, the last day to have turned in gifts in the office that will be credited for your taxes for 2017 was Friday, but if you put something in the offering plate today uh, and it is marked for 2017, she will record it for 2017 when she returns. Uh, and speaking of tomorrow, we have a very special service tomorrow at our sister congregation, the St. James AME Church. Uh, uh, St. James is a Methodist church. We are a United Methodist Church. They are African Methodist Episcopal Church. <coughs> And they are hosting a community-wide celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation was issued on January 1st, 1863. And they're inviting the community to come and celebrate uh, uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning at St. James AME. They have asked me to be the preacher. So uh, w how many of y'all will come with me? Please come with me as we join our sister congregation and others from our community uh, for a great celebration of, um, of freedom. Freedom is a theme of, uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, uh, and a great time of unity in our community. I hope that you'll join me tomorrow uh, to celebrate a new year and a new beginning at St. James AME at 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I do hope that you'll be praying for those who uh, you'll see in your bulletin our special need of our prayer. Uh, Scott Fossum was in the hospital this week. He's home, but we need to continue to pray for his uh, continued recovery. Uh, we are praying with uh, Janice Beard. I thought I saw Janice a minute ago. She's not in her usual spot. Her sister-in-law, Kathy, has gone home with hospice. So uh, please be praying for this family during this a sacred uh, and yet difficult time. And pray uh, for Bill Kleinhans and Gladys, uh, Bill's son, Gladys' stepson, Murray, passed away this week, and uh, they will need our support in 
uh, in the days to come. With these and other concerns, let us turn to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> God, we thank you for this day, a day that you have made. It is a day like every day, a day where your mercies are new, a day uh, where the power of the resurrection is offering us new life. It is a day where your grace is more than enough for our need. It is a day where the love of Jesus Christ is offered for all people. And yet it is a day that we feel differently than most days. We have come to the last day of a calendar year, another day to you, but a day where our hearts are especially prepared to reflect, to look back, to look forward, to take stock. This past year is full of uh, celebrations and disappointments for all of us, of... Uh, Things in our lives that have been great blessings for which we are deeply grateful. It has been a year of love and it has been a year of uh, victory from you. It has been a year of good things from your hand, you who are uh, the father of lights and the author of every good gift. And it has been a year where we have failed ourselves in many ways. We have failed those who love us. We have failed in all the intentions that we brought to this past year. It's been a, day, a year that for each of us has uh, brought its own kinds of griefs, its own kinds of joys. And so today, we ask God, that you would give us the capacity to learn from the good and the bad and to set this past year aside. We offer all that is good and all that has been difficult to you. We hand it over to you. It is the past and it is gone. Help us, Father, to live in your grace and your redemption and to move forward with you. And many of us will make plans and we will have resolutions and we will try to improve ourselves in the coming year. And many of us will once again fail in our own best effort to be a better us. And so, Father, when a new year begins tomorrow and the calendar turns, give us a heart to live in the light of your glory in each new moment as you give it to us and to allow the gospel of the good news of your love revealed to this world to be the power that sanctifies us Help us, Father, to set aside our vain efforts at self-improvement and to open ourselves to your agenda and teaching us to love and teaching us to receive your love. 
May your spirit move afresh in each of us and in all of us. And this time that we are reflective and open, may you do a new thing, a new thing in our midst. Father, be with those who are grieving in our midst and those who are suffering in body. And there are many who need an extra measure of your grace. We have offered our prayer to you because we trust you, because you are good. And so, Father, receive our prayer and receive our lives. And may the living Christ be born in us again. We join our hearts, we join our voices in praying as the incarnate Lord taught his disciples and has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Invite our children to come forward for the children's minute. We've got some here for us today. Come on down. I always like to have the boys come see me. Come on down, Charlie. Come on today. Well, today is the last day of 2017.
and tomorrow. And tomorrow, I got a bunch of boys down here to make this morning. And tomorrow starts 2018. And you know what? The one thing I do to get ready for the new year, I get me a new calendar. <laughs> church. We'll invite the ushers to come forward as we'll take up our morning tithe and offering. Pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the gift of your son that has made every good and perfect gift possible. 
And take these gifts that we give back to you and use them uh, to feed the hungry, uh, to clothe the naked, to preach the good news to the poor, to do your good work in a world that needs to know the good news of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> standing turn in your hymnal for our hymn of preparation it's number 237 sing we now of christmas
Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 2. If you would turn in your Bibles, please, to uh, Luke chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 22. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, there's a pew Bible available for you in the, in the pew rack in front of you. Listen for God's word. When the time had come for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit rested upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you're dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory of your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what had been said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. And at the moment she came and began to praise God and speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may be seated, please. Well, I've been able to ask some of y'all one by one, but I want to ask you all, how was Christmas? Did you have a good Christmas? Yeah. Did you have a good time? Was it good to be together with family? Uh, my mom and my dad and my aunt just left yesterday. Just yesterday. Now, we had folks in and out, and we were in and out, and, um, and, and now we've got um, shrapnel all around our house. You know what I'm talking about? I think all the paper's up, but there's, there's not a surface that doesn't have some toy or some little piece or something uh, for the cat to damage or hide. It's, uh, it's that time, you know, where the tree has gotten awful dry. Anybody started taking your Christmas decorations down yet? Anybody? Yeah, the, the commercial side of Christmas is winding down. Amen? And some of us are like, oh, man, are we singing joy to the world again? The first time we sang joy to the world this season, we're like, joy to the world. And some of you are like, joy to the world. Here we go. I've sung it a few times. But 
According to the church calendar, we're supposed to just be getting started good, celebrating Christmas. We kind of we celebrated our Christmas a little early. We do that. More and more in the culture, we start earlier on Christmas, and we celebrate Christmas before it's Christmas <laughs> instead of having a good, strong advent of expectation and preparation. Uh, we're supposed to have 12 days where we are throwing a party for the presence of God in our lives, in our world, for this great thing that has happened that the creator of all things has become part of his creation. I'm grateful for everybody who came today. Um, in most churches, this is the lowest attendance Sunday in the church's life. Did you know that? Um, uh, when I first got out of seminary, I was an associate at First United Methodist Church in Panama City. And the Sunday after the last Sunday of the year, one time I went to a training event with a bunch of my friends who were all associate pastors. There was the associate pastor from Fairhope, First United Methodist Church. There was an associate there from the Montgomery First United Methodist Church. There was the associate there from Dauphin Way, which is like the first church of Mobile. All these associates all came together, and we all got to talk about what we had preached the prior Sunday. At some of y'all, that's taken a while. Because if you've ever been an associate, Brother Ron, you get the joke, don't you? You never got to preach. You just sat there and smiled. When the preacher was preaching, the senior minister went away and said, you got it, kid, <laughs> for the last Sunday of the year. But y'all are here, and God is here, and it is Christmas. Thank you for being here to celebrate the presence of the living Messiah in our midst. This season, where the vestments are white to celebrate the revelation of God in our midst. This season, where we say that the Word has become flesh. This season, where we tell the story of the King of Kings who has become humble and vulnerable as a child. Uh, this season is based not on what we do. It's based on what God has done. Every Christian holiday is focused on the good news of what God has done. The focus is on God and not us. The good news is that God has done something remarkable amongst us that has changed everything. In this season, we celebrate that God took flesh that the God who made the world has become part of his world. The God who made human beings in his image and likeness has become a human being to show us his intention for us, to redeem us, to introduce love into a hateful world. It's good news. And God is eternal. God is bigger than our calendar. He is uh, bigger than our lives and the way that we order our lives and break our lives into months and weeks and days and hours and minutes. What God has done transcends the limitation of our time. Whatever God has done is eternal. And so when we come to a Christian holiday and we say, God did this among human beings, whatever the Christian holiday is, we say, what God did here is eternal. Christmas is not just a day or a season. Christmas is God's statement about who he is and how he lives with us always. Am I making any sense to anybody? It's not a day. It's not 12 days. Christmas is how God names himself. I am God Emmanuel. He's not just with us 2,000 years ago. 
He's not just with us on Christmas Day. God has done this thing in time and space and history to say, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will always be with you. What we celebrate on that day changes everything for every day. Every day is different. All of human history is different. Being a human being in the light of our Creator is different because God became one of us. God has shown His character. He has shown His heart. He has shown who He is from the foundation of the earth, from before time in this great thing He did by becoming one of us. And it makes us live different, be different, think different every day. We have a song that we sing at Easter. Uh, Easter people, raise your voices. You know that song? Easter people, raise your voices. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be singing in front of everybody. It's not my strong suit. This past week, Royce Reagan dragged me up on a stage and had me sing. Huh. Thankfully, I wasn't alone. Right, Richard? <laughs> Royce Reagan will get you in the worst kind of trouble doing things you never anticipated. Anyway, this song says, Easter people, raise your voices. All right? Now, and it says in there, Every day to us is Easter. Now, it's an interesting song. It states something that we should be aware of any time we come to a Christian holiday. Is that if we are people who worship a God who has done this, it makes us a different kind of people. If God allowed himself to be killed for our redemption and raised into new life so that all things can be made new, it makes us a people who live in the power of new life every day. That's what it means to be Easter people. Are you with me? So what does it mean for us to be Christmas people all the time? Not just on Christmas Day, not just in Christmas season, but in July, in August, in good days and bad days. What does it mean to be Christmas people? Miss Janie, I've got to admit to you, that you and I, I think, share something we haven't discussed, which is I imagine we have the same favorite Christmas album. <laughs> My favorite Christmas album, I hate to tell you, is the Elvis Christmas album. <laughs> One time, Royce Reagan got me to sing Blue Christmas in front of a church. <laughs> that ain't happening today. That's what Royce Reagan will do to you. But that's, Blue Christmas is not my favorite song on that album. My favorite song... What's your favorite song on that? That's mine too. Miss, Miss Janie and I, we got the same favorite song from the Elvis Christmas album, which is Every Day Like Christmas. Why can't every day be like Christmas, right? You know, I hear the bell. Oh, you're about to tear up, aren't you? <laughs> St. Christmas is near. They ring out to tell the whole world. Look, she's getting misty-eyed. But the one that always gets me is, Ah, if you're a child, telling Santa what to bring. All right? And the smile upon his tiny face is worth more to me than anything. Woo! I'm riding in my car. Oh, me and Elvis are crying. You know, and he said, why can't every day be like Christmas? Why can't that feeling go on endlessly? If every day would be just like Christmas, what a wonderful world that would be. And it's sweet, and it's sappy, and it's nice to sing at Christmas time. And Maggie Grace is in the back seat of the car like this. But friends, for people who have had a vision of God's statement of himself 
Every day is Christmas for us. Every day is Christmas for us. We are a people of the incarnation. We are people who live Christmas every day. Christmas' message is God is here. God is not in outer space. He is not removed from us. He is not angry with us. He is not withholding himself from us. God makes his home with us. He moves in to stay. God is here. Emmanuel, God with us. The message of Christmas and the reason we give gifts is that God is a gracious God, a giver of every good gift. God does not withhold his heart or any good thing from his people. God has given us his son, his life. If he would not withhold his son, Paul says, would he not with him also give us everything else? God pours out his life his heart, his love, everything for us. He has made us beloved children. Christmas says that God is a giver of every good gift, every day, always. Christmas tells us that God is a saving God. He saves his people to the uttermost. God is a God who sees the concerns, the heartache, the brokenness of his people, and he brings salvation to all people. The salvation of the soul, but also a salvation of the body. He hears the cries of people who are broken in life in every way, and he knits his life to their concern. As the choir sang, the, the message of Christmas is, love has come, and God ha- has something to say about himself. That's what it means to say the word, that the word has made flesh, that this child, This thing that God has done by becoming one of us is what he has to say about himself. And what he has to say about himself is love. Love, not the way that the world defines it, but a love incomprehensible. A love that the world had never seen. That changes us. If we believe that God has has demonstrated his heart, his character, his nature by by taking flesh and becoming present with us, then then we become people who carry the presence of God when when others are struggling, hurting. We we rush in and we, we sit with them and we be with them and we are not folks who abandon. We carry the presence of the living God into every dark place. If God is a God who is generous and good, then we, then we are people who have learned not to hoard and hang on to our heart or our substance or anything in this world, but to be able to be gladly generous. As an aside, I will say thank you to you all because uh, I, the last count I heard, I think that we topped $10,000 in our gift to the United Methodist Children's Home White Christmas Offering. Thank you. Thank you. It's an expression of the heart of God. <clears throat> to be glad and generous givers. <clears throat> to bring God's presence in a meaningful way. I, 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 um, I have a friend who's a pastor in Texas. and When we were in school together many years ago, uh, he told a story about how... Um, when he was a little boy, he was afraid of the dark. And one night he was crying, and his, uh, his mother came and said, John, what's wrong? He said, he said I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid to be alone. She said, well, John, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Jesus is with you. He said, 
Well, Mama, I know that, but I need someone with skin on. <laughs> Christmas says that, that God put skin on. But the reality is that most people can't feel it that way until someone comes along and carries God's presence to them. It actualizes the physical presence of God. Somebody said, uh, the hands of God are hanging from your wrists. And when somebody is grieving and you bring a casserole, then you have given them a sense that they are not alone. And because God's people love them, because God's people are there, God has shown up in their life. I love today's story. Today's story is an undertold story. I don't know why Simeon and Anna don't have all kinds of songs about them. I don't know why uh, we don't hear about them as much as the angels and the shepherds and certainly the magi who, if you read the story carefully, didn't show up until two years later. But Simeon and Anna show up in the story the week after Jesus is born, this week. Mary and Joseph bring the child to the temple uh, for dedication, his circumcision, to take on the sign of the covenant. It's uh, what, in, what we do when we baptize a baby in uh, our traditions that have infant baptism or in traditions that practice adult baptism, what they do with a baby dedication. They dedicate him to God and he is marked as a child of the covenant, a member of the family of God, a member of God's people. And there at the temple, they encounter two prophets, two great saints, two older adults who have spent their lives looking for God's salvation. I love how Luke has these couplets Usually of men and women, there's Mary and Joseph, and there's Elizabeth and Zechariah, and then uh, later on we'll hear a story about a man who loses a sheep and a woman who loses a coin. And he has this couplet of a, a man and a woman, each a prophet, each a holy person, each with a vision that is focused on God's presence in his world. The first is Simeon, who has spent his whole life praying that God would send a Messiah, praying that God would visit his people, looking for salvation, looking for salvation in a person that God would send and through him would bring his presence. His heart is marked by gratitude and joy. And... He has a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment once he sees that child. He says, all my life I've been waiting, waiting to see the salvation. He says, God, now I can die in peace because the thing that I've hoped for, the thing that I've prayed for, the thing I've given my life for has come. He offers even a tough word to Mary. He says to her, uh, this child will, will bring uh, the rising up of some and the bringing down of others. And because of that, a sword will pierce your own soul. Now, there's, there's a phrase in the Bible that mothers understand. Somebody said, when you have a child, your heart is walking around out of your body in the world with you having almost no control over it. And every mama in here has at some point or another known what it is to have a sword pierce her soul. And then there's Anna, who early in her life uh, was widowed. And so she dedicated the rest of her life, all of her days, to God's presence, to God's house. When she sees Jesus, she tells everyone who comes to the temple, I've seen the Messiah. Messiah has come. God has come. 
Simeon and Anna are Christmas people. They're people who recognize the difference that it makes that God has done this thing. They're people whose, whose uh, life focus has changed from themselves to the glory of God. It says in there that they're devout. And, and the way it's described, it doesn't, doesn't look like they're sanctimonious types. You know, when we hear about somebody devout, we think of somebody who's been baptized in pickle juice. Oh, holy face. You know what I'm talking about? Look. The, these, are, these are two folks who, whose hearts radiate joy and their hearts radiate humility and awe at what God has done. The dedication of their life is about a, a change in focus, an ability to see things that others miss I have an aunt who loves plants. She loves flowers. And uh, from time to time, she'll take a trip. She, she one time went to England to do nothing but look at gardens. I would never do that. You know? And she's like, look, there's a flower. I'm like, oh, it's a flower. She'll know, like, the Latin name. You know these kind of people? I once lived with some people. Uh, I, I had an apartment when I was in seminary, and I stayed during the week with a retired United Methodist minister and his wife, and they were that way with plants. They would be driving down the road, and they'd see some plant growing on the side of the road, and they'd pull over and dig it up and take it home and plant it in their yard. And they'd say, oh, you never see these, right? They could see things that I would never see. I'm like, ah, oh, it's a flower. What kind of flower is it? Uh, Blue, ah, you know, but they, they knew that flower's not supposed to be here. They could see something different. People are that way with, with birds or with music or whatever has caught the intention and the focus of their lives. And Simeon and Anna saw that child and they saw something that all the mobs passing through the temple missed. They saw the glory of God. Because it was the focus of their attention throughout their lives to look at God's glory. The story says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were folks who because... They believed in God's presence in the earth. It's most celebrated by the incarnation, God's be becoming flesh and the Christ child. They were able to embody God's presence wherever they went. They were carriers of the incarnation. Hey, have you ever been in a time or a place where you could recognize God's doing something here? God's doing something now, from time to time, we get complacent in our faith. Protestants have a good, uh, a, a good excuse for pretending that it doesn't matter when nothing is happening. I say, well, we've got faith. So God's doing something even if it doesn't seem like it. Well, that might be true, but that can also be a good excuse for, for not even caring whether we can see God's movement in our lives. I was talking to my um, lay theologian type father, and he said, he said, Protestants have that problem of having a theological excuse to, to not even bother when nothing is happening. And then, and then there's the other way where you can have a... Uh, a kind of sacramentalism. You can have a ritualism that says, we're going to fluff things up so that we can pretend that something is happening when it isn't. It may at least make it feel like it. These two were moved by the Holy Spirit. And they live with a sense that God is here, He is alive, He is active, and this thing is not a fake. God is present. 
And it is amazing. They were amazed. When's the last time you were amazed by God? Simeon and Anna were people of Christmas because they became witnesses. They couldn't help but to tell everyone, to sing God's praise. Have, have you ever been uh, uh, sort of guilted about how you don't witness to your faith enough? Have you ever felt that way? I have. Ooh, you need to witness. When I, when I was growing up, uh, sometimes they put a stack of ta- tracks in my hand and we'd go down to the shopping center and pass out tracks to people. I did not grow up Methodist, amen? And I was, I was so scared and I hated it. I did it, but I hated it. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I'm confessing my sins to the World Wide Web on the internet. There's a camera there. Anna and Simeon didn't have to try to witness. You got to try to witness to something if you haven't seen anything. But if you've seen something, you can't help but witness to it. Because they had seen God visit their lives, they poured out a song of praise. This is my... Christmas question. Have you been visited by the glory of God? God is here. God is in this place just as much as God was present when Simeon and Anna took the Christ child in their arms and the crowds passed by and had no idea that the answer to their prayers was right next to them. God is here, and life can be infused with the presence of God. Simeon and Anna were a Christmas people for a lifetime, and they found their fulfillment when God did this great thing that shows his heart and his way in all times in all places. May God show himself to us today so that in every day, in every circumstance, we might be people who live Christmas in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we close the service, I would invite you to turn to page 219. And uh, we will sing all the verses of what child is this. As the Lord leads you, I invite you to come and pray at the altar. The presence of God is with us. The heart of God is open to us. Let us stand as we sing what child is this. Angels sing.
May God bless you and keep you. His face has shone upon you through the face of the Son of God. May you go from this place in the light of his glory uh, to be a Christmas people, to sing his praise, and to witness to the great thing that he has done in you. May God's peace be with you always. Amen.